So uh, without further ado, let's uh, uh, plunge in, and Richard will be leading off. Right, thank you, Jeff. Uh, I'm going to do the, for me, an exceptional thing of that is to read some notes because I want to avoid saying anything that might be a policy recommendation at this stage. Uh, and, uh, and I'm even going to avoid those perspectives because I thought that might get me into policy territory. I want to start with some facts. Uh, and uh, the, um, there's a range of facts that I think are really important and perhaps not as well known on this side of the Atlantic as they are on the side where I live. The Greek crisis was definitely different from Portugal, Spain, Ireland. It was a clear case of exceptional fiscal profligacy, which stemmed from a populist and clientelist political system and a very weakly institutionalized state. There was a common feature, big capital inflows, financing big current account deficits. Those inflows were in good part a consequence uh, for Greece of its entry into monetary union, but not of any particular structural flaw in monetary union. After the crisis broke, the pace of fiscal consolidation in Greece until the end of 2014 was exceptional. The 15, 16% deficit, uh, primary deficit of 12% uh, in 2009 came to a down to a pr small primary surplus at this, in the second half of 2014. Also exceptional, however, was the drop in GDP, 27%, and the rise in unemployment to 28%, youth unemployment over 60%. The initial bailout in May 2010 involved no debt forgiveness, nor any restructuring. It was a bailout of the banks that had lent to Greece, mainly French and German. And as in Ireland, Spain, and Portugal, the foreign lenders were in effect bailed out by domestic taxpayers who took on the burden of repayment to the official sector lenders. From this comes the dominant narrative in Germany and elsewhere that Greece is solely responsible for its problems and is morally obliged to repay its debts in full. With the big, with the big fall in output and the continuing fiscal deficits, despite the default and debt restructuring in March 2012, with 75% haircuts for the private creditors, nominal debt to GDP has risen substantially since 2010. But extend and pretend has given an important reduction in net present value. Uh, the debt is significantly lower because of reductions in interest rates and a sizable extension of maturities. Uh, since March 2012, all the debt virtually is held by the official sector. The ECB has 130 billion euros worth of, of it. The European Stability Mechanism has another 130 billion worth of it. And the rest is with national governments elsewhere in Europe and the IMF. There's been a huge internal devaluation Real wages are down 30%. Yet, very little gain in competitiveness when measured by final good prices. That's not just because of price rigidities, uh, because also, during the same period, there have been substantial increases in taxes, electricity charges, social security contributions, and so forth. Result, internal devaluation has had very little effect on exports. The balance of trade has improved, but it's import compression because of the fall in GDP. Export supply is constrained by a wide range of product market imperfections and financial constraints and a structure, an industrial structure, that is very unfavorable to export growth because it's mainly small firms. The main export is tourism, and peak period supply capacity is actually pretty well exhausted before the reason fall in bookings, uh, but uh, normally. Uh, and second, the second major export is shipping, of which, for which the domestic costs are very small. So that suggests that membership in the currency union as such is not responsible for the current situation, and that Brexit, with an effective large nominal devaluation, is unlikely to have a substantial effect on net exports, and hence on aggregate demand. Instead, because of balance sheet effects, it's likely to be contractionary if it happens. Unlike Argentina in 2002, Greece would not be selling primary commodities into a global boom. Also, unlike Argentina, it's not self-sufficient in food. In fact, it imports basic goods such as grain, rice, paper, uh, as well as energy, actually, and pharmaceuticals. Immediately e eliminating the trade deficit would just add to the pain. Greece would be chaotic, Brexit rather, would be chaotic in the short run, 
and highly in inegalitarian because the oligarchs and much of the upper middle classes have already moved their funds abroad. Others, well, with lower incomes, will suffer a further big drop in those incomes. Series' program for the January elections included increases in some government expenditures, rehiring per personnel, various government departments and so forth, while seeking debt forgiveness and reversing some labor market and pension reforms. But their political program also in included uh, some, an attack on the oligarchy, on clientelism, and on tax evasion. Well, they delivered on taxes, um, uh, taxes in the sense of um, reducing some, and expenditure in the sense of increasing some. Uh, but they didn't deliver on the reforms, the deep structural reforms that were necessary. Uh, and we, are, we have now a semi-failed state, uh, the, a, an environment in which business really can't function. Uh, investment has collapsed. Tax payments have actually collapsed in the spring, uh, long before the bank closures. The European Central Bank is the lender of last resort for the Greek banks, uh, acting through the Greek banks by extending what's called emergency lending assistance. The ECB capped ELA when the referendum was announced, and that led to the bank closures that we've seen, limits on cash machine withdrawals and so forth. Uh, but the ECB has not imposed yet any additional haircuts on the collateral supporting Greek bank borrowing. That collateral is typically Greek government bonds. As long as the ECB deems those banks solvent, though illiquid, it won't cut the ELA. But it's no longer playing the lender of last resort role by maintaining their liquidity, supposedly on the grounds that uh, uh, it can't rely on any new Greek government bond collateral in the absence of a program agreed with the Eurogroup. On the other hand, it's also not yet judging them insolvent and invoking what we now have in Europe, the single resolution mechanism, in order to intervene and restructure and recapitalize the banks. And even with liquidity, you have to realize, of course, that the banks would be in deep trouble because of high and rising non-performing loans. They're supposed to be support, uh, pr proposing a program to the, so we've got a couple of minutes, good, uh, to the Eurogroup uh, by 8.30 Central European time tomorrow. Uh, and apparently, according to news reports, they've already put something in. Uh, the, there will be a summit uh, for the first time uh, here of all heads of state and government, uh, not just the Eurogroup, to consider all this. Uh, a payment to the European Central Bank of 3.5 billion euros is due on the 20th of July. A new program requires approval from all Euro area parliaments. Well, not all, but most. Um, uh, and um, if there is just a short-term program that were financed, for example, by the European Stability Mechanism, that might not require parliamentary approval but um, it would probably still in Germany. Part of the background to all this is a new IMF paper issued three days before the referendum with a debt, service, debt sustainability analysis that showed Greek debt is clearly unsustainable and recommended debt relief in exchange for various reforms. But you know, there is a huge gap, and you cannot really, I think, from here perceive it, a huge gap of trust and credibility uh, there between Greece and its Eurogroup partners. The polemical rhetoric has been extreme. A lot of it doesn't get reported here. A lot of it probably doesn't even get into the press. Um, but uh, I can assure you, uh, it's pretty awful. Uh, and uh, the Eurogroup countries simply don't trust Greece to implement reform measures. So they're reluctant to promise negotiations on debt relief without seeing some concrete reform measures first. And Greece has said, yeah, they're going to have some soon, right away, tomorrow, yesterday. I don't know. Uh, but at best, what you can expect from the summit uh, is, I think, a commitment to start discussions about debt restructuring. There are major political obstacles to uh, an agreement outside Greece 
beside the issue of trust. And now I'm talking about the rest of Europe, the Eurogroup in particular. Uh, almost all Germans, as well as important elements in the German political parties, oppose any further support for Greece. Many openly argue for Grexit, exit from the monetary union. The far right and the far left in both France and Germany see Grexit as a step towards the dissolution of the monetary union, which is what they like, what they would like. So does the main right-wing party in Italy. Governments challenged by parties on the left, like Spain, with elections in the autumn, don't wish to give concessions that might make it appear that if those parties came to power, they too could negotiate a better deal with the Eurogroup. The Prime Minister of Italy has recently taken a position of total solidarity with the German Chancellor. Several small countries, especially those that suffered a lot during the crisis and those with per capita incomes below those of Greece, see no reason why their taxpayers should put any more money into a bailout. In fact, only France seems to have broken away, and that just within the past couple of days, uh, and coming out uh, for, with some support for Greece. The US has intervened um, uh, orally uh, with, uh, with the Europeans, pushing for a deal. Doubtless motivated not only by concerns for economic stability, but also uh, by geopolitical issues. And the fund, with dominant US influence and a French managing director, has also openly supported an agreement. Now, I had some notes about what we might expect to emerge in the early hours of Monday, but I've just, I've, a little past my time, and I'll stop now. Great, thank you. Our second panelist is Carmen Reinhardt. So, uh, Richard uh, dealt with uh, Jim's, Jim also sent us an email in several volumes as to what we could not say. So, I, I, I will resort to sign language. So, <laughs> if, I, if I say something and go like this, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, Jim. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I, 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 I'm not, I'm not. But at any rate, what I'd like to do is divide my comments into three parts. Uh, I'll try to draw on lessons uh, and to deal with Jeff's question, I think, at least the more reflexive question, what have we learned? I think the general answer is very little. Uh, we seem to have an ability to re regenerate these crises again and again. But um, in terms of outlook, I will get to the second question you pose. So the three areas that I want to cover very briefly have to do with uh, the nature of debt relief. That is to say, uh, what type of debt relief is associated in history with better outcomes in terms of debt resolution. Uh, the second issue that I'd like to address is if, and here I'll answer Jeff's second question, if things uh, are heading in the direction of Grexit, which look increasingly to be the case in my reading, uh, what is next, and to that end, I'd like to focus on episodes of forcible currency conversions. Uh, we haven't seen, we don't have a lot of evidence on exits from currency unions, but at least we can make some inferences from countries that not de jure, but de facto have been highly dollarized and tried to uh, switch their banking system back to the domestic currency. And the third issue, very briefly, that I'd like to touch on is the issue of potential contagion. So let me start first on the issue of the modalities of debt reduction. So here we are at the 11th hour, and it's only starting to be uh, openly discussed uh, by the creditors that debt relief is needed. Uh, this, I think, has been the, the, the need for debt relief and debt reduction, I think, has been fairly evident for some time. Uh, but we've, we've only just gotten there. 
Uh, it is not unusual at all if one looks at the timeline of debt negotiations in the past. One of the things that emerges from uh, the, the work that I've done with Ken Rogoff and the work that I am currently doing also with Christoph Trevish is that the process from beginning to end is a very long one. That is to say, the initial credit event, which sometimes can be a default or it can be a restructuring to the final one that you reach resolution so that you can say debt sustainability has been restored, is a very lengthy process. And part of the reason it's a very lengthy process is the demonstration that we have ahead of us, which is namely creditors do not want to take a haircut. The borrowers ultimately will insist on a haircut. And in the end, the most common experience in these episodes is a haircut. That is to say a write down of principle, not just an extension of maturities and a reduction in interest payments and increased uh, grace periods. I do not think Greece is going to be an exception to that pattern. That has been, and if you look, for example, at the debt crisis in Latin America of the 1980s, the uh, Baker plan was essentially intent on providing cash flow relief, but no write-offs. The ultimate closure of the debt crisis came with not the Baker plan, with the Brady plan. And that involved haircuts that ranged from you know, close to 90% for Bolivia to very little for Chile, depending on the country's situation, which is the other issue that I want to address. The fact that it takes so long to get from beginning to end in these processes is actually not just devastating for the borrower. If you look at it and step back, it is also unwise from the creditor, because if you look at, in, in ongoing work, this is still you know, ongoing. I, I, we'd be happy to share slides. I don't have the paper yet, but Christoph Trevish and I have been asking the question of what are the determinants of the size of the haircut? And historically, three factors come to mind. One is the initial stock of debt. Second, the cumulative decline in GDP. And third, and this is not in, in order of importance, I'm just listing them, uh, the duration, the time it takes from the initial credit event to its ultimate resolution. In other words, the longer it takes, the more the economy contracts, uh, the bigger the needed haircut to restore debt sustainability. So ultimately, it from the vantage point, of the creditor as well, uh, the idea of extend and pretend is not, not uh, uh, conducive. Now, once one reaches that last restructuring, positive things can happen. Namely, from the not just work that I've done, but other works, for example, a paper by a recent paper by Helos and Sahai looking at the question of market access. Market access is actually pretty quick once you, the, the, the market sense that uh, debt has become sustainable. So let, I know that I'm pushing time, so let me move on. So the, the, the bottom line of what I've just said is in countries where this situation has been so severe as Greece, both in terms of the initial level of debt, the magnitude of the collapse in the economy, and the time that it's taking, it is hard to see resolution without haircuts. Let me move on to the second issue, which is let us uh, for a moment assume that the, the, that the negotiations do not get anywhere in the next few days, and the situation in Greece right now is untenable. That is to say, not only do you have the maximum amount of withdrawals from banks as, as, as this is permitted, but the, the fact that the, pop, the population is trying to hoard euros also manifests itself in other ways. Namely, we, we see it, the shrinkage of the liability side we see more visibly because we can track deposits. But the, the hoarding of euros also manifests itself in the non-payment 
uh, of taxes and the non-payment of existing debts. So if, if you actually aggregate not just bank loans but credit card debts, some estimates that are not, not unduly uh, uh, exotic, but very conservative, place non-performing loans at a roughly three quarters percent of total assets and rapidly rising given the economic implosion. Uh, if you track government arrears uh, in tax, tax payment arrears, they match Russia's in the run up to the August 98 crisis. Okay, now the last uh, issue that I'd like to, to uh, make the case why a currency conversion is likely to be sooner rather than later is the government itself. The government has been funding itself by domestic arrears, namely non-payment of, of, of suppliers, non-payment of rents. So far, they've been paying wages, but it's a matter of time under these eco extreme economic conditions that you're not going to see script and you're going to see a transition to, uh, uh, to, to, to the drachma. And so, how much time do I have? I'm, I'm done. Okay, well, <laughs> let me just say on, on the transition to the drachma. I did a Vox piece today, because these were my notes preparing for this, looking at five episodes of transitions from de facto dollarized economies uh, to the domestic currency. Let me summarize the, the experiences of those five countries is not a happy one. And this is not a statement of causality here. The, the, by the time the countries introduced these measures, they were in states not dissimilar from Greece. Okay, so it's not like this generated the problem. But it certainly didn't solve it immediately, which is the main point. And, and, and the main point that I would like to leave since I'm out of time is that the persistence, that, it, that is to say I very much agree uh, with Richard's assessment that in this case the idea that one could introduce a currency, generate devaluation, and that would act as a quick catalyst to revival. It, I'm not saying that over the longer haul that certainly that mechanism isn't there, but I think the overwhelming financial disruptions are going to be the dominant factor, and I think uh, um, economic conditions in, in, in any scenario uh, are going to be very grim. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Carmen. Our third speaker is Gita Gopanath. Thank you. Uh, so let me take the <coughs> questions one at a time. So the first question is a snapshot question about prospects for Greece. Um, I think I would summarize the prospect as saying that it will take a miracle for Greece to be uh, in the Eurozone, to continue to be in the Eurozone. Uh, and I say that for two reasons. Uh, one is that the fiscal targets that are going to be a part of any of these negotiations are just becoming increasingly hard to attain. Uh, and the second reason, because I think there's a complete breakdown in trust between the Troika, the creditors, and, uh, and Greece. So let me elaborate on the, on the fiscal front, why I think things look particularly dire is because, for one, the revenues are drying up. Uh, you know, Greece was at some point running a primary uh, surplus. Uh, and now, if you look at the projections, you know, the best case projections say that the primary deficit will be about 3% of GDP. Um, you know, given the economic contraction that's happening over there, given uh, the recent bank closures, given the kind of complete breakdown in economic activity, uh, it probably will get a whole lot worse and the primary deficit will get much bigger. So just in a very passive sense of trying to meet the fiscal targets, the revenue sources are drying up uh, very quickly. So then the question is what they can do in an active sense in terms of actually undertaking reform both on the revenue side and on the expenditure side. Um, and here, uh, you know, there was a deal on the table, uh, there was a good referendum on it, and it was soundly rejected. Uh, and now anything that they have to come forth with has to be a, a lot more than what was actually there on, on the original deal. So the political 
costs associated with coming up with a far more ambitious plan uh, are very large. Uh, and so in that sense, I just think that it's just in terms of what can be done in terms of the revenue targets are just, just getting more and more dire. Uh, and then, of course, there is the question of implementation. And here is where we get to the issues of, uh, of trust. Even if they do put a plan forward with numbers that seem to suggest that, uh, you know, that they will undertake the reforms that are uh, required, uh, I don't know whether there is any trust on the other side that this will actually happen, whether this will actually be implemented, will th this will actually be put into laws. Uh, and so there's, I mean, there's been you know, all kinds of name calling that has happened. There's kind of all <laughs> immense amount of distrust. So once this gets taken back to individual countries, whether they can actually, the creditors can actually believe that this will, uh, this will play out as, as is being said. Now, the one positive to you know, a deal working out is the fact that Cyprus is, uh, you know, has changed its tone towards the other parties uh, in Greece, the more pro-EU parties who definitely want to be uh, in, the, in the Eurozone uh, and a part of the EU. And so because of that, you know, it's possible that deals will pass Parliament more easily and, you know, think, uh, and uh, you know, a miracle might happen. So there's some recent news that comes out that they are putting together a pretty aggressive package. But again, I mean, I, I still believe that, you know, if not in the next few days, it, it will take continuous miracles for Greece to continue to be uh, in the euro area. As for the second uh, question about lessons uh, that we have learned, I think there are two kinds of lessons. One lesson is for the euro area, and the second lesson is for our understanding of debt crises. So for the first lesson for the euro area, I think that what we've learned is that the costs of having a currency union without having a banking union uh, and a fiscal union. I think that this, cri this crisis is made abundantly clear. Uh, so on the first one uh, about uh, the banking union, uh, so there are two things that come up there. So for instance, one, if, uh, if there was a EUI, deposit insurance scheme, uh, then we would not have seen a translation of sovereign debt crises into, uh, into banking crises and then into currency crises. The reason that we saw run on banks is because of the fact that there wasn't an EU-wide uh, mechanism to put a backstop on, on people's fears about the fact that their money would not be in the banks when they show up. So you do need to have some sort of an EU-wide deposit insurance scheme. Uh, the second thing, because there is no EU-wide mechanism for bank restructuring or for bank recapitalization, uh, this whole thing got caught in what's called the doom loop between the uh, sovereign debtors, sovereign debt, and uh, and the banking system. So, kind of insolvency on the sovereign side turns into insolvency in the banking sector, and this doom loop just kind of aggravated uh, the outcome for uh, for Greece. So. For in terms, you know, in terms of going forward, in terms of what's required for a currency union to uh, succeed, I think it's abundantly clear that you need a banking union. The second thing that they need is a fiscal union. You need to have uh, automatic transfer mechanisms. You know, Greece has paid a lot. It's about its, its GDP has contracted by 25 percent. The unemployment rates are, you know, around 25 percent. This is a huge, hugely costly for the country. Uh, if there were automatic fiscal transfer mechanisms in place, if there was an EU-wide uh, such a fund for making these kinds of transfers, then again, we would not have seen um, what we're seeing here. So just going back to the point about the banking unions, uh, you know, one possible strategy to have kept Greece or to keep Greece in the euro uh, area is to have shifted the negotiation from one being about bailing out uh, governments versus being one about bailing out the banking sector. You know, by doing that, you, you know, let governments make their own decisions, decide how they want to raise their finances, something that they're asking for, something that the Greeks have voted for, and then instead focus the bailout attention on the banking sector, which is more about uh, preserving Greece and the euro. And the last point about uh, the lesson is in terms of what have we learned about debt crisis, how does that affect uh, our understanding uh, about how debt crises work, uh, and this is where I'm going back and thinking about what we know in the literature and what seems like a gap. And I think that the one thing that has come out throughout the whole euro crisis is the fact that far more than economic efficiency considerations, 
you know, political considerations seem to have dominated every part of uh, how this crisis has played out. I mean, if you go back to the genesis of the problems, if you think of Greece back in 2010, uh, when its debt was clearly unsustainable, you know, there was one of three things that could have happened. One was to let Greece default and let the creditors suffer. These would include the German banks and the French banks. The second option was to bail out, uh, bail, bail out the Greek banks and bail out the French banks directly, but let Greece default. So let Greece default and then you directly bail out your own banks. Uh, and the third option was to go and actually bail out the Greek government and then indirectly bail out your own banks. Now the choice of the third seems to have been an outcome of not just economic efficiency arguments but about political considerations and I think the mess that's turned out in the, over the last five years is, is a result of this. So just going forward from, uh, in, in terms of our improving our understanding for future debt crises and uh, of how these things work, I think we need to have a little more of political economy considerations when we enter into discussions about sovereign debt, into discussions about sovereign debt re, uh, restructuring in terms of bailouts. Uh, we've done a good job of trying to understand why political economy considerations can lead to governments building up a lot of debt, but we have a lot less in terms of understanding how these considerations play uh, in the middle of a debt crisis. Great. Our uh, fourth speaker is Paolo Pacente. Um, I have no idea what will happen in Greece. I have no idea what are going to be the implications for Europe. Uh, I did my homework. I checked what many people these days are saying about the subject, uh, including many folks in this room. And I can report quite conclusively that collectively we have no idea what will happen. <laughs> uh, so I've, I didn't think that was a good uh, uh, answer to uh, Jeff's question. So I started writing down some thoughts about all this. And uh, not surprisingly, given the subject matter, uh, the thoughts took the shape of uh, something that looks like uh, uh, well, a Socratic dialogue between Greece and the Troika. Uh, so probably not too far from what is actually happening behind closed doors in Brussels. So here it is. I hope it confuses you as much as it confuses me. Uh, we'll start with Greece, obviously on the left. Uh, Greece, <laughs> here we are. How we got here is not the point. The uh, point is we are on the verge of an economic and social catastrophe and not one of our making. Our banks are closed. There are long lines to get a few euros a day if you're lucky enough to find an ATM which is not yet out of order. Tourists are cancelling their reservations. Traders are not getting letters of credit to finance their imports. Uh, many young people have no jobs. Uh, firms have no cash to pay the few lucky ones who have won. Drugstores stop selling key medicines, pension payments are missed, social unrest is creeping in, all this and could have been avoided. On the right, the Troika. How we got here is precisely the point. You have been bailed out not once but twice and what exactly happened with all the funds we granted you? The only conditions we require were to invest in the future of your country, guarantee fiscal sustainability, restore confidence in your finances, after five years, you are back to square one, unable to repay your obligation to the fund, something that puts you in the glorified company of Somalia, so, uh, Sudan and Zimbabwe. And instead of taking responsibility and begging for forgiveness, you want to dictate the terms of a third, meaning third bailout, spending even greater financing needs over a greater, longer time horizon. Greece. You may have heard that we held a small referendum last week, and uh, <laughs> by the way, landslide outcome. The message was that the whole country is fed up with all this contractionary and deflationary and disinflationary policy that you euphemistically call conditionality. The Greece of today is paying for the mess of the mistakes of the political and economic elites of the past, and we have paid enough. Since 2010, we have been implementing spending cuts virtually unprecedented in an advanced economy. What is the result? Hardship, misery. Our GDP shrank by one quarter and counting. We have nothing against growth-oriented policy, but we want to stop repeating the mistake of going through bad strategy that shrink output faster than they shrink debt. 
reform fatigue only boosts the appeal of more populist alternative. It does not help us, it does not help you. And also, if you don't mind, we would like the Greeks to be master of their own destiny. Troika. Nobody likes conditionality and nobody likes to come to us. So if you don't want to deal with conditionality, just don't put yourself in the condition of needing it. <laughs> Our country, in similar circumstances, they've gone through similar rounds of austerity and have successfully overcome their burden. Ireland and Portugal are true success stories. Spain and even Italy have been able to pass important reforms. There is no reason, and not to mention willingness, to give you any special treatment. It would be unfair, it would create a bad precedent. If you are serious about structural reforms, where are the comprehensive proposals and prior actions in terms of legislating policy to fight bureaucracy, inefficiency, corruption, tax avoidance? What about liberalizing product markets, cutting over regulation, raising general retirement age, constraining early retirement? What about recapitalizing our banking system, wiping out insolvent institutions, incentivizing m and Show us the progress on reforms and we'll show you money and perhaps that relief. And if you don't like it, nobody's forcing you to stay in the zone. Greece. <laughs> Nobody here wants to leave Europe. There are too many unknown unknowns associated with Brexit. And in spite of all your rhetoric and the editorials of build, you are the ones who prefer muddling through and kicking the can down the road one more time rather than dealing with the potential scenarios of social unrest and uh, political radicalization. And if you can spell geopolitical vulnerabilities, go and check the map of Europe, uh, see where Greece is and where Greece will remain after Brexit. <laughs> what we want to be is part of a better Europe, possibly a more solidaric one, but at least a more pragmatic one, where pragmatism means accepting that counterproductive conditionality has been revamped, unrealistic fiscal targets corrected, socially costly spending reconsidered, at a much shorter time horizon, days, uh, pragmatism means starting talking seriously about debt relief uh, this weekend, a bridge loan by July 20, and an increase in emerging liquidity assistance above the 89 billion cap as soon as possible. Troika. Last time I checked, solidarity requires trust and respect of obligation. And an ELA extension, what for? To feed a massive deposit flight? Greece, avoiding addressing the last question. If not, we will have to start introducing and circulate some form of temporary IOU. Let's call it CH, which is a currency Hellenic, uh, <laughs> or a drachma without a drama. <laughs> Troika, taking some time to digest the latest pun. <laughs> Troika, CH, my funny. What you are suggesting <laughs> is to introduce a parallel currency and dual legal tender, and this is a break of treaty. I knew you were not here, new material. Let's go back talking about Grexit. <laughs> Greeks, should I remind you that in 2009, the United States of California issued about 500, 550 billion of IUs during its financial crisis. And in spite of this, the dollar is still the only legal tender in San Francisco these days. Troika, should I remind you that California is part of a full-fledged federation of 50 states and you are, well, the Hellenic Republic. <laughs> no federal transfer for you. Greece, which is precisely the point. <laughs> if Greece were part of the United States of Europe, we wouldn't be having this conversation. By the way, have you seen any good optimum currency address paper at the MBR Summer Institute? <laughs> Troika, no, we never accept their invitation. So, <laughs> And this can go on forever, but to, to, to try to summarize and answer, answer Jeff, uh, despite postural rhetorics, the two parts are really not that far away from each other. An agreement is possible, it requires a dual mixture of safe face, uh, uh, which is not unheard of in, for, for European standards. <laughs> uh, the deal could involve a bridge loan, uh, it will could involve some form of funding from the European Stability Mechanism, conditional reform, if I'm not mistaken, a proposal has been, has been uh, uh, submitted. We'll see what is the outcome and what is the, uh, um, the perception. What happens in the event of a no agreement uh, uh, by Sunday morning? Well, most likely the Euro Leader Summit will discuss Grexit and humanitarian aid. The ECB will suspend ELA financing on Monday morning and the Greek government will issue the CH and maybe eventually leave the euro. Um, 
On this, I think, I pass it to the next <laughs> panelist. <laughs> so last but not least, Anil Kashyap. Thanks. Um, when Merton Miller used to meet somebody new, he would say, what do you think is going to happen to interest rates? So he could get the question out before they, <laughs> they could ask him. And I, so what do you think is going to happen to Greece? Um, I, I think we need political scientists. I'm going to just repackage something that's been a theme for all of the other panelists. Um, I think you can only understand how we got here by realizing that the Greek, uh, current Greek government failed to understand that all their grandstanding that played so well domestically had an equal and opposite magnitude effect uh, internationally. And so whatever trust they might have had the day they were elected was, was destroyed. Um, and so this negotiation has been um, needlessly complicated. If you're addicted to this, um, if you go to the leading uh, Greek newspaper, uh, spelled K-A-T-H-I-M-E-R-I-N-I, -I -I, and you uh, Google the term saga of the Greek review, you find a very interesting narrative about how the official sector pulled the plug on the last government with optimistic views about uh, the CISPRUS team may be compromising. I found that uh, very interesting uh, because you, you might ask, why did, why did they pull the plug on the last government? It was actually doing pretty well. Um, so anyway, I, I'll make two more points about politics and I'll try to answer the economics question. So um, I think at this point too much attention is paid to Germans in, in terms of the negotiations. Something that's been echoed by many of the people is um, there's lots of vested interests that have no, no interest in seeing a uh, substantial compromise being uh, reached. Germany doesn't care about Greece. They could fund this in a moment. They can't fund uh, Spain or Italy if they get similar terms. So for the the Greeks, um, if they're rewarded by having sent in this extreme uh, government, the Germans understand that the Italians and Spanish will copy that playbook, and at that point they have a real problem that they can't contain. Uh, it's also the case that the incumbent governments uh, that are more or less going along with the preferred route that the Germans uh, favor also have no interest in uh, being kind to Greece because they know that would be signing their own uh, dissolution. They'd be uh, defeated in the next election. So there's, there's plenty of players that don't want to see a substantial concession to the Greeks for having elected this uh, government and then held the referendum and seeing the way it went. So that, that's a constraint that binds anything that's going to happen in the next uh, coming days. I think any deal that does happen has to uh, uh, recognize two other constraints. So the first is the incumbents can't be seen as rewarding the, uh, the incumbent governments and Germany can't be seen as rewarding the, the Greek government. The, the two others are the IMF must be paid. It's kind of remarkable given that the, the decisions that have been made and even the admissions of mistakes by the IMF but it's still going to have to get paid because the world needs somebody to, to clean up these messes. And if, if Greece is ever forgiven uh, their IMF debt, the IMF ceases to be able to go in. Uh, I, so I, I think the IMF will somehow get paid. It may not be in an NPV sense. There may be stretched out payments and all that, but somehow the IMF will get its money. And that means the total size of the funds that have to be raised will, will be higher than it would have been otherwise. And then the, the third constraint is that uh, CISPRUS has to be able to sell whatever deal he strikes. Um, search Twitter for the following phrase in quotes, big if true, and you will find a July 7th article from the Telegraph uh, newspaper in the UK where there's a long article explaining that CISPRUS never intended to win the referendum. His, his plan, according to this article, was that he wanted to have the vote, figure it would come out yes, he would then resign honorably. Somebody else would have to come in, implement the, the reform that would be uh, devastating for the economy, but eventually would work after much more pain. Six months from now, he's running on a campaign of, I told you this was a crazy thing, and he's reelected without ever having have his fingerprints on the plan. Now, that sounds like a reasonable forecast as, as what he might have been thinking, because it does not seem like they do have a plan. Uh, <laughs> So now think about these three constraints, the IMF, 
the creditors who can't be seen as rewarding them and him having to sell something. And you could see easily why it would not be possible to um, strike a deal. According to the latest news feeds, it seems like Cisperus is going to try to say he's ready to compromise and that the thing they sent in half an hour ago may reflect concessions. We'll see when they parse the numbers. Every other time we've heard this, it, it didn't go there. So um, my best guess is still that there will be a bust up, uh, even though it's really not in the citizens' interests in any of these countries to, to have that go forward. In terms of the economics, um, something kind of similar to what Gita said, um, there are many plans for what could be done right now. Uh, Pierre Olivier Grincius has one, William Bauer has one. The spirit of these plans are separate saving and recapitalizing the banks from forcing adjustment on the government. So these, these variations of these plans would say, take whatever money you need to to keep the banks open, that keeps the country functioning somehow, but force off the government from being able to get any more funding, not internationally nor from the banks. So they would immediately have to close their primary surplus. They would bear all the, the forced market discipline that would you know, necessitate many changes and see where that goes. Now, the adding up of the cost of all this it would, be, would be pretty high, but I think you know, that kind of a deal at least satisfies uh, my three constraints. If you figure out the ESM eventually pays the IMF, the Greek government is seen as being uh, penalized internationally, and the Greeks can say, we're still in Europe, we're still on the euro, um, and then after they start implementing the pain, they'll get fired, but you know, in the short run, it looks like it works. So um, my forecast is they will not get there, that that won't happen, and instead they'll end up issuing script and, and going, down, um, going down that route. But I, I think even now, this, this would have, uh, probably be a more a appealing option. I, I, don't, I don't know how you'd implement it. In terms of my big lesson, I would say um, unplugging the banks from the sovereigns is something that uh, seems like it's going to come back to us. I, it'd be interesting to convene in five years and see where Japan stands on this front. They have deposit insurance and all of that, but their banks are chock full of 200% of uh, GDP's worth of debt as well. Uh, and, and there are many other countries that are uh, sitting on banking systems that have so much debt in them that it would be very, very hard to, to repay if, if there are doubts about the, the um, viability of the debt load. So that would be my one takeaway. Very good. So uh, I'd like to uh, thank our panelists. We're all going to be wa watching eagerly to see what happens. That, that completes the panel. Uh, we're now going to turn to the second half uh, of our session, which is uh, throw it open for discussion.